the way through. More importantly, this would be accomplished by determination, hard work, and most of all, confidence in herself and her talent. She will also like to say to her kids, see, you can do it. This is her fourth speech entitled, The Other Side of the Tracks, Tanya Holloway. When I was in fifth grade, I attended a predominantly white elementary on the other side of town, similar to the phrase, on the other side of the tracks. One of the first people I met was a girl named Melissa. I thought she looked just like Holly Hobby, and we instantly became friends. Like most girls, Melissa was having a, a sleepover for her birthday and invited me. I eagerly told my mom and asked if I could go to the party. She hesitated giving me an answer right away. She didn't ask about the particulars, such as the time or the place, just that she needed to talk it over with my father before giving me an answer. I thought this was a bit strange, since I didn't get the same response when asked to stay with other friends in the neighborhood. But given no choice, I waited. Finally, at the end of the week, my parents gave me permission to go to the party, but not the sleepover. She told me she would be attending the party with me to determine if I was going to stay for the night. Then they started interrogating me with a lot of questions like, what's our address? 2604 Glen Garden Avenue. What's our phone number? 5342666. Again, this was all very confusing. I wanted to go to a sleepover, not another country. <laughs> <laughs> But what I didn't understand was that my parents came from an era of segregation, and their children were the recipients of the civil rights movement. America's adjustment to the new way of living was still somewhat fresh, and they didn't know how I would be accepted in an untapped environment. They knew Melissa was white, but they didn't know if Melissa's parents knew I was black. When we arrived at the house, my mother said we were keeping the sleeping bag in the car just in case. I rang the doorbell, and when the door opened, a rainbow coalition of children answered. I wondered, where did all these kids come from, because I had never seen them at school. Melissa came around the corner and was excited to see me, and introduced me and my mom to her brothers and sisters. They were Cambodian, Vietnamese, East Indian, South American. I, I don't remember how many there were. Only that Melissa was her parents' only biological child. I can assume my mother was very shocked, and after talking with her parents in the kitchen for a while, instructed me to get my sleeping bag before she left. We had a great time that evening, and I remember trying to stay awake long enough to finish watching Mary Poppins. During that time of transition, venturing over the bridge or the tracks was like discovering undiscovered territory. You didn't do it unless you needed something. In most communities, particularly in the South, blacks and poor people were rele relegated to homes by the railroad tracks. To this day, if a black person says to another, the town is still divided by tracks, we instantly know there's racial tension in that town. Divided by the tracks is how I view certain instances in my life as an adolescent and as an adult. And it wasn't until much later when I did my own research in African American studies did I realize we, as a people, we never did it alone. For example, the Quakers assisted heavily in the success of turning thousands of slaves into free men and women during the Underground Railroad era. Three white people, William E. Walling, a journalist, Mary White Ovington, a social worker, and Henry Mossowitz, a Jewish social worker, helped form the NAACP. Freedom writers, from the North were black and white students who fought together to challenge segregation, and even the election of Barack Obama could not have been won by the black vote alone. Through all the horrible trials and tribulations, blacks, whites, Jews, and Gentiles have always fought together to close the division. The textbooks only got half the story, and it wasn't until I opened my mind as well as my heart was I able to accept the bottom line 
and that is, you can't do it alone. Juan Williams, an author, expresses my sentiments exactly. He says, for some people, insight comes like a flash of revelation. For others, it arrives like a slow dawn as understanding rises gradually to replace dark indifference. As we open our eyes to the power of race in American society, we begin to perceive the impact of class and gender too. Dropping the blinders reveals how often we heap disdain on the elderly, people with AIDS, people with little education. Every American also has to figure out how to deal with people who are rich and people who are poor. People who were born here and people newly arrived. People whose ancestors are passengers were, were passengers from the Mayflower and those whose ancestors came here as slaves. There's no getting away from this quandary. Choices. We all have to make them. And they don't stop as we get older. They just sometimes become a little bit more complex. People are people, and every day is a struggle to make the right choice. Am I going to explode at the waitress who keeps getting my order wrong? Or am I going to find a measure the importance of the situation and find a calmer way to react to my anger? Am I going to keep honking my horn at the man who's idling at the green light? Or am I going to give him a few more seconds? Because I myself have been caught idling at the green light. We have our differences. And I encourage each to embrace those differences rather than analyzing it beyond reasoning. Those differences is what gives us something to read about, to talk about. We travel to see it and we pay money to eat it. The older I get, the more I can now understand Anne Frank's words when she says, I keep my ideals because in spite of everything, I still believe people are good at heart. Now more than ever before, we are closer to the days when it is no longer a reverie to see America not divided by the tracks in war.